My mission is simple, to make you money. I'm here to level the playing field for all investors. There's always a bull market somewhere, and I promise to help you find it. Mad Money starts now. Hey, I'm Kramer. Welcome to Mad Money. Welcome to Kramerica. Other than my friends, I'm just trying to make a little money. My job is not just to entertain, but to teach you and educate you. So call me at 1-800-743-CBC and tweet me at Jim Kramer. We can't get a strong employment number like we did on Friday and just forget about it on Monday. It's too important to leave in the dust like some kind of run-of-the-mill data point. So on a day where the Dow dipped 11 points, at the SB edge down 0.04%, and the Nasdaq advanced 0.03%, I think it's actually worth thinking about, if not resurrecting, what the non-farm payroll report means for our economy and our stocks. First, as I said for years, this is the single most consequential set of numbers we get from the government. Nothing comes even close to the monthly labor report. That's how big it is. I first analyzed this over a decade ago, and it's never lost its significance when I look over the years. This is the number that controls a lot of the narrative. So let's break down the release. First thing that catches my eye is the household survey, where the unemployment rate's 3.8 percent. The economy created 300,000 jobs last month. People yawn at that number. That's ridiculous. We have 3.8 percent unemployment when we've had 11 rate hikes, when there's a 5.3 percent short rate historically high, when the Fed's attempting to suck the liquidity out of the system. Can you imagine how low the unemployment rate would be in this economy if the Fed were trying to create jobs instead of stamping them out in order to beat inflation? Right now, this country is nothing short of an economic miracle. Scrolling down the Labor Department release, the 303,000 jobs created is much higher than the 231,000 average over the prior 12 months. That is remarkably hot. This morning, I got to interview Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo about a $6.6 billion grant to Taiwan Semiconductor so it can help support an investment of $65 billion in three greenfield leading edge semiconductor foundries in Phoenix, Arizona. If it takes $6.5 billion, by the way, to get $65 billion investment, that's pretty darn good carrot. But when we drilled down, Madam Secretary said the project would create 20,000 construction jobs and 6,000 direct manufacturing jobs when finished. I, frankly, was flabbergasted because I couldn't even imagine where they're going to find these people. It's going to be borderline impossible with unemployment this, ro- this low. We simply don't have enough documented and permitted construction workers in the, that part of the country, and America doesn't produce enough engineers to ensure that Taiwan Semi can get things going by the end of the decade. Given that these are the best of the best chips, at least for right now, we're going to have to recruit like you wouldn't believe. If we only produce 70,000 undergraduate engineers each year, Taiwan, a small island nation with, with not even a tenth of our population, has 11 major engineering programs with 176,000 students. What a disparity. When you consider that our country added 39,000 construction jobs in March, about double the average monthly gain, it's worth asking where the heck Taiwan Semi is supposed to find an extra 20,000 construction workers, maybe in the greater Phoenix area? Are you kidding me? They will have to do a nationwide search to have all the people they need. This is not the old days where there was a plenty of surplus labor in the United States. Most of the other numbers, like part-time employment or labor force participation, were little change in March. These numbers would typically be going up maybe even a big at this point in the business cycle, which would put downward pressure on wages. No, it's not happening. So we scroll further down, and we see that average hourly earnings for all employees increased by 0.3%. Over the past 12 months, wages are up 4.1%. That's incredibly consistent and, yes, incredibly strong. It makes me question whether the Fed should even declare that they were done tightening. Because with this kind of hot labor report, it sure feels like they left the job unfinished. How about the jobs? Where are they? We put 72,000 people to work in health care. Now, we know that nurses are incredibly short supply, but 18,000 of those are in nursing and residential care facilities. Again, where the heck are they going to find these people? Or how about uh, find more of these people? Or how about hospital workers? They added 27,000 jobs. Could that be uh, more post-COVID surgery, something we know has hurt the health insurers? They have to keep hiring people. You know that this, the price of labor is going to go much higher. We're constantly discussing the state of the consumer. Aren't they cash-trapped at this point? Apparently, we should stop worrying people because employment and le- leisure and hospitality trended up big. The report said, and this is now returned to it's, it's now returned to pre-pandemic February 2020 levels. That's an increase of 49,000 jobs. That's another sign of a roaring economy. It could be that more people are coming back to work and, and uh, going out to the same old places. It could be that the work from home people have started being more social. It could mean that people are long on money and short on time and realize that they miss too much of life 
when they were cooped up in their homes for COVID. Remember, COVID changed our habits, and unchanging them is not easy. We acted like it went like that. It didn't. Then there's one that seems beyond the pale. Government hiring at 71,000 positions, which is higher than the average monthly gain of 54,000. I can't even imagine what that's about. These are the big gainers. Everything else is pretty much the same, which is a statement in itself. Now, there could be some give here from immigrants who get documented status and work permits, but the government won't disclose those numbers. I understand where they're coming from because it's politically sensitive. But unless we get more workers or more people lose their jobs, the economy could stay too hot, and long-term interest rates will keep climbing as they were today. They're back to November's level. So now let's zoom out. We know that employment truly decides consumer spending, which is about 75% of our economy. We can make a ton of presumptions about the consumer from these numbers. To those who think that credit card usage is up big and therefore dangerous, I counter with these employment numbers. Auto sales not strong. These numbers say they're, that's, that's surprising, unless... The auto companies had such bad supply chain problems that they finally caught up and are now outrunning all the job creation with this new product, including unsaleable EVs. These labor numbers make me understand that we learned uh, why what happened this morning made sense. That's Blackstone Real Estate. That's a division of Blackstone, the private equity firm, just shelled out $10 billion for AIR communities. That's a big real estate investment trust. Owns 76 high-quality rental housing communities in coastal markets like Miami, Los Angeles, Boston, and Washington, D.C. Blackstone says AIR communities represents the highest quality large-scale apartment portfolio they've ever bought. Blackstone's decision to buy these properties makes me think, while office real estate may still be questionable, apartments might be undervalued. This is different from when Steve Mnuchin and his pals poured a billion dollars into New York Community Bank Corp, which seemed a little dicey to me because so many of those units were rent-controlled, suspect mortgages. Here, Blackstone intends to put in $400 million to maintain and improve the buildings and intends to invest to pursue further growth. You don't do that if you believe this economy is facing a hard landing or even a soft landing. You only make that kind of decision when you think it's a no-landing scenario, which is what I'm starting to believe, which brings me full circle to the story of this employment board. We have a robust economy, so I'm a lot less worried about this upcoming earnings season. When I check the record historically, this kind of job creation without a ton of inflation is about as good as it gets, regardless of where short-term interest rates are sitting. Bottom line, if you're hoping for Fed rate cuts from the Fed, I say maybe don't hold your breath. This, this economy doesn't either. Just be glad we aren't getting any more rate hikes. Yikes. Ed in Florida, Ed. Hey, Ed. I mean, hey, <laughs> Jim, this is Hamed. Right. I'm calling from Florida. I just wanted to see uh, if your opinion on uh, Abvi. I've had it for a while. I want to see if it's going to be uh, going sideways still or it's a sell or uh, Well, it, it's hold. been hurt by the a turn against these stocks. Um, but the stock was at 182. It's come down to 169. I would tell you that I think that at 163, 164, I would actually start buying it again. We owned it for the trust. We sold it. We made a lot of money. And I'm looking to get back in. It's only because they make Botox. And Botox is essential for a lot of these people who take the GLP-1 drugs. Let's go to Bob in Illinois. Bob. Bob? Hello. You're, uh, Bob, you're up. It's Jim. Okay. Um I've been invested in Kava for a while. It surged from 45 to 65. I got stopped out uh, a little bit around 60, and now it's kind of floundering around. Is there a good point to re get back into it? I like Kava back? right here. To be honest, I like Kava. I think it's a terrific situation. It's come down from a high. Uh, it's got, uh, to me, it's got great fundamentals, long term growth. Feels a lot like Chipotle did when Chipotle started. You're not going to find the stock to be ever really cheap. It's got too good a bloodline to have that happen. All right. This economy doesn't need rate cuts. Just be glad we aren't getting any more rate hikes. If I look at that employment report on Friday, oh man, money tonight. Gold just touched its all time high. So why aren't the gold mining stocks following in the precious metals footsteps? I'm listing some important reasons why there's such a dichotomy in the space. Then we're continuing our series on winning small cap stocks by surveying the financials and seeing which names investors could, quote, bank on for potential gains. And you can find Ferguson inside your home. You can find it on the construction site. But does the stock deserve to be in your portfolio? I'm getting the latest from the CEO. So stay with Kramer.
miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Cramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Cramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.